But no, we'll start it off then. So it is the topic of discussion is the expansion of the college football playoff. And we love your uh, your expertise that you can bring with us here is writing for UCF, a non-Power 5 school, and just what it could do to impact them. So overall, when you look at the general idea of what is being presented to the NCAA when it comes to expanding the playoff, how do you feel about it? Do you think it's good, bad? you're kind of undecided yet. Well, you got to pick which side you're looking at. For UCF, it's the most complex, and here's why. They're a team that could make the playoff in the 12-team pool. That's If you don't understand that, that means you're probably an SEC homer that doesn't think anybody but the SEC should be let in. That's first off. <laughs> and I, you can quote me on that. Uh, they, SEC fans drive me bananas. But the fact of the matter is, getting into the playoff is step one. To win the playoff based on the proposal that I read, and I just skimmed through it because I know there's going to be a whole lot of changes. Teams one through four, and we probably have a fairly good idea it's going to be one of about 10 teams in those four slots. That's just the way it is. You give them a week off. I don't care who they play in the next game because uh, team 12 plays team five. The teams one through four have a week off. If you give Clemson a week off and then they play anybody thereafter, even if like, Al- I know it's not going to be this way, but if Alabama was team 12 one year, you know, their quarterback got hurt, they barely made it into the playoff, and Clemson's got a week off, it's not going to be that great. This is about one thing, and it's money. The statement that some of the so-called athletic directors put out was garbage. It is 100% about money. They already know if you're in the top four, the chances of you not winning your first game when you do play is pretty darn low. A week off, even if the teams are fairly even, at that point in the year, you've already, you know, a major injury, your quarterback got hurt, the week of practice, et cetera, is tremendous. So looking at it from a who's going to win it standpoint, nothing changes. Zero. Zip. Not. Now, the second point, though, is long term. UCF, back to that. Once you get in, you do get a part of the money. And I don't know how the money works exactly. Does everybody get the same total? Do you get the same total to start? And if you get more money, if you advance, I have no idea. But once you get in and get that money, you can take it and build facilities, get better coaches and or keep the coaches you have by raising. Uh, to put it in perspective, Sarkeesian, that just took the Texas job, the poor guy, he was only going to make $3 million a year coaching at Alabama as the offensive coordinator. It's ridiculous. But, I mean, UCF can't do that traditionally. It's just reality. Most schools, from a perception standpoint, even if they have a booster that says, I'll write the check, won't do it because they've got – boosters and alumni and faculty, et cetera, that get very angry about it. It's all political. And it's like I told a professor once when I was at Indiana University, they gave the basketball coach an extension and I was in a locker room with him and I was just a jerk and interrupted him. I said, sir, just so you know, you teach you taught some kind of science class or whatever. Nobody's paying to watch you teach science. They will pay to see the coach coach a basketball game. He got really crappy with the look he gave me, but it's still true. Coaches get paid a lot of money because people want to watch what they do. Do you have enough money? And can you tell those other people goodbye? I'm doing it anyway. Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, Texas, certain schools do, while others are real touchy about it. You know, Vanderbilt's never, with all their money, their endowment, they could, if they wanted to be a national football power, they could. They don't want to be. They don't want to be. So does UCF, Memphis, schools like that that are not power five, do they pony up? Once one of these teams gets in and it'll happen pretty quickly, do they take that money and invest it not only in their facilities and their coaches, but do they invest it in a way that the whole community will rally around it? Here's something for you. UCF is the largest school in the country. It's got 72,000 students. That's humongous. Now, there's a lot of people going to like what's going on, and there's going to be some people that don't. From what I'm seeing right now on Twitter, it's all the positive people. But how are the alumni that don't like it going to act? I'm not take, not going to give you my money, et cetera. Those behind the doors scenes are also very important. Again, at Alabama, you don't like it, you can hit the road. They're, they're going to play football and they're going to play at a high level. You have to commit to that financial commitment no matter what happens on the side. And that's very, very touchy for UCF or quite frankly, any institution. So I'm really curious to see how that advances because once these schools get in, people are going to start plucking coaches even more. You think $3 million for Sarkeesian's a lot. 
wait till you see like the first school that is a quote unquote non power five to actually win a playoff game, which I don't think will happen very often at all. I'm just going to be blunt. If you're not power five, you're not going to win playoff games very often. And I'll get into that in a second. But the first one that does just got paid. He could jump up into saving money, which is not realistic, but that's what you would have to do to get him to come to another school, Tennessee or whatever. So there's a lot of different angles if you're UCF, good and bad. But initially, Clemson, Ohio State, Oklahoma, Alabama, Georgia, Notre Dame, LSU, there's a handful of programs. They just have better players. And you give them a week off, too, it's going to be a slaughter. So do you think – you said that it doesn't matter what – it doesn't change who's going to win. It just adds to how many. Do you think if – do you think that's regardless if we said we go up to 24 like the FCS has? Is it just it doesn't matter? We just because you have what it is with Ohio State and Alabama and Clemson, there it doesn't matter how large we make this playoff, it's always going to be them. Or do you think that if you can expand it even more, it almost levels it out? It will never be level like we'd like it to be, right. just because that's just how it is. Like you said, money and politics and everything that goes into it. But can it level it out with more? Or do you think no matter how big it gets? it's always going to be these same programs that are the, that definitely will win it. There's two things that go hand in hand with what you just asked. And I touched on it a little bit. If you watch any football, CBS, ESPN, et cetera, you'll see one of the commentators use these flashy names or sayings. One of my favorites, uh, David Pollack talks about war daddies. It's a common phrase. It's been used for a very long time. I live in Tampa. I was actually, over in Lakeland today, Gabe um, Dendy is arguably the best D-tackle and arguably the best player in the country, plays at Lakeland High School. He wasn't there when I was there, but I went and saw him play in the spring game. He's just finished his junior year. He's physically ready to be a junior in college. He can physically grab you, do everything wrong, grab you, remove you, and chase down a guy that weighs 100 pounds less than him. I watched him do it. If you do not have those guys, you are not winning a championship that has zero to do with coaching. He was a starter on Lakeland's 2018 team that won the state as a true freshman. He was just a normal kid who walked in. As soon as he walked on the field, one of the coaches told me, yeah, we'll take that guy. They knew without him even hitting anybody, he was a dude. He started for the team and won 7A state title. That's why Clemson, Ohio State, Texas, out the D linemen and corners only go to about 10 schools. That's it. That's why they win. You can scheme all day on offense, score points. You recruit to win on defense, defensive line and corner in particular. And those guys, they go to schools for exposure in the NFL. They get more of it at certain schools. And if you've ever toured the facilities, I've had opportunity to see a lot of things, obviously. At a place, uh, this for example, like LSU, uh, even like I went to school at Indiana. Indiana's facilities are ridiculous. And they're a middle of the pack Big Ten team. And their facilities are still way better than the vast majority of programs in the so called non power box. It matters. So, until somehow, some way, some of these schools find a way to get guys like Gabe to go look at their program and actually sign, there's only that small list. I can go coach Gabe Dindy. It doesn't matter. He's going to run over you and tell you about it. It doesn't matter. I mean, he's 6'4, 280. And I'm not kidding. He ran down a 180-pound kid in like two seconds. It was insane. Those are the guys that change football, war dads. And, of course, at corner, you're on an island. You can't, you can't hide. I don't have to explain that. That's why so many of them get drafted in the first and second round of the NFL draft. UCF just had like three or four guys that went to the draft in some capacity or they went free agent. But they were still ranked like 121st in total defense. I mean, that's atrocious. The last staff didn't do a very good job. So they had some talent that they developed, but they didn't figure it out. If that same talent goes to Alabama, they figure it out. The, the coaching is also a part of it. you got to give the coaching credit. I can't stand Nick Saban's personality, but I can definitely say, hey, if you can find a better DB coach, give me a phone call. I haven't found him yet. That's why they win. They, they get him and they coach him. It's not one of those both. So, yeah, it's, it's really hard. The only exception that I can ever think of of a non-Power 5 type team winning it was way back in 1984 when BYU went undefeated. They didn't play anybody. All the big boys just killed each other, and they didn't have any – they played in the Holiday Bowl. I mean, that, that's a terrible bowl game. It's just in San Diego. 
and they got the national title. They weren't one of the top five teams. They went undefeated, though. That's the only time it's ever even remotely happened. And that's obviously, if they were to play Alabama today, they'd lose by 30. It's just the way it is. So unless somebody's got something that I don't know about, it's not going to change. The money will slowly help some of these other schools, and maybe they can quip up an Alabama that's beat up. Uh, maybe their quarterback gets banged up or something. But in a normal situation, barring injury, there's about 10 schools that get those war daddies, and that's it. So you said – so we talked, you, you talked about step one was just getting into the playoffs. Um, right. you, use UCF as an example just because I know you, got, you cover them. Um, thinking long term, the more teams do you think it affects UCF in their recruiting because they've not been able to get into the playoffs? That sounds like a silly question, but do you think it legitimately affects them as far as recruiting purposes? It's the chicken and the egg. It's a great point, and it's something I I was talking about it on one of the uh, Facebook groups I'm with on uh, UCF football. It, it's really hard. It's like, well, we can't beat school X, pick whichever one of those big schools you want, Ohio State, Texas a or whatever, without the players, but the players won't come as a general rule until you beat those schools. So the only way you'd really get lucky now, and, and there is an asterisk, and that's the transfer portal slash the grad transfers. Like UCF has like seven, and they got some guys. In there. Big Cat is coming in from Auburn. When he walks in the room, he's like a 6'4", 6'5", guy, 250, and he's sleek like a 160-pound sprinter. When that guy walks in the room, it changes things. Now, they obviously have a bunch of guys that came over from Auburn, so they knew Big Cat. They recruited him. But other than that, it's really hard. Um, Dindy was on campus, ironically, at UCF yesterday. Are they going to get him? I highly doubt. But you can't hit a home run unless you swing your bat. So they had him. They had a bunch of kids from Alabama. Um, Woods is a kid. You're going to hear his name. He's a 23D lineman. Top five guy conservatively in the class of 23. He was at UCF last weekend. He's at Thompson High School in Alabaster. It's just outside of uh, Birmingham. Those kind of players keep coming. You're going to get somebody eventually, and they've got some really good recruiters on their staff, including T. Will, Travis Williams, a defensive coordinator, is as good a recruiter as there is in the country. But until you show me with the pen signed and the document faxed in, you're not getting – I'm a glass half empty guy. They have to prove it. Now, they're putting in more effort than about any staff in America. It's unbelievable. I've been around. I've been to camps. I've watched them. The staff, everybody – right down to the student managers. But those guys probably need to see something. And then this fall, again, they were 121st or something like that in total defense. I don't think Travis is going to be able to put out a defense that's going to impress a national top five 2023 prospect. Just my opinion. Plus, they lost mm -hmm. DBs to the NFL and they were 121st. Not a good omen. So, so how I, do you get there? How do you get them? Right. So I, I agree. I think the parity is awful. Like, you know, I'm a huge college basketball fan, and that's what, to me, is what makes the sport so great is just because there's that parity. But long-term, by expanding the playoffs, just obviously it ain't right now, but do you think maybe, you know, 10 years from now, could you see parity between 1 through 25 versus 1 through 11 like there is now? No. You don't think it's going to happen? Even by expanding the playoffs, you don't think it'll happen? Well, there's two things that they can't go that far because there's just number one, that'd be too many games. Football's different. It's not like the NCAA tournament. Right. I grew up in Indiana. I know what basketball is about. I'm from as an eccentric basketball town as there is in the world, Newcastle, Indiana. But football is about violent chess. It's a bunch of pieces moving around, but they're moving around into each other. You can't play that many games. 12 is about as far as you're going to go, maybe 16. But you still have to do something with the buy for some of those teams to buy into it. Yes, pun intended. Alabama and those schools, I guarantee you, privately are saying, if you're going to do this, we're getting a buy because we know we're going to finish in the top six somewhere, or top four. I guarantee. Now, don't deny that on their grandmother's grave, but those schools want buys. And part of the reason they're going to get it is because their fan bases are bonkers. I mean, that's credit to them. CBS, ESPN, NBC, Fox, they want to put out a product that brings in advertising dollars. If you put in A&M, Texas, Notre Dame, and Alabama as your final four, can you imagine the TV ratings for that? 
they want those schools to win. Now, again, they're never going to admit that. But show me a playoff system that's even proposed that doesn't have a buy. You won't see that. I guarantee it. Uh, you're not going to see a one versus 16 tournament. You'll, you'll see some kind of configuration. But if it got anything beyond 12 teams that competed, I'd be surprised. Now, there could be a, a one off year. Um, think about some of the quarterbacks that went high in the draft, guys from North Dakota State, Montana, and stuff. If one of those kids ended up at, say, Iowa State, they go undefeated in the Big 12. That's not, I know it's Big 12, but that is about as close to non power five as you can get. If you've ever been to Ames, Iowa, you know, <laughs> don't, don't blink. Don't blink. You're out of the town. It's over. Okay. If they, one of those schools goes 12 and 0, you just got to win your title game, the Big 12, which isn't, you know, not easy to probably play Oklahoma or Texas. Who's to say the quarterback, and, I, and I, I'm picking Iowa State because one of the guys I know, Rocco Beck, is the quarterback at Wiregrass Ranch High School just outside of Tampa. His dad played in the NFL. He's going to Iowa State. He's going to light it up. But they can't stop anybody because they don't get war damage. They don't have any Gabe Dendys on that roster. I can guarantee you that. Um, a couple of years ago, I went to see Notre Dame play Iowa State in the bowl game. There wasn't one kid that started for Iowa State's defense that would started for Notre Dame's defense. Not one. They got a great coach. They got good schemes. Where they at? They, getting defensive players is what separates the top ten. And it's like me at 228 pounds or whatever I weigh trying to race one of the Kenyan long distance runners. It's not going to be competitive. It's just the way it is. I, again, it's a broken record. Show me where these schools are going to get elite defensive players. Never happens. So prove me wrong. Well, I want to go back to the transfer. So you have UCF with who they've brought in and you go towards, well, can you point? And I think you can point a lot of that towards you have Malzahn coming from Auburn. And so my thought would be with, and I get your whole point of if you, no matter how big this playoff gets, it is always the same few teams that are going to be competing, really competing. And so, right. but my thing is if you have a team like, Look at what Houston did just a couple of years ago when they poached Dana Holgerson from West Virginia. And it was that movement towards we could get these big name coaches that have maybe fall, fallen out of grace at the power five level. They go to non power five. So they build that up to where they are competing because you have a name. Look at Liberty with Hugh Freeze. He made some bad choices at Ole Miss. That's why he's there. But it is still a big name. They know he can coach. And so now you look at what Malzahn is building at UCF, it could put you in contention to where you are the team that could rock the boat and you are the team that could maybe make that chance, take that chance and make that run late. And so I think it, I, I, I see what you're getting at with the point of it is still these four teams. It is always, you can never count out Alabama. You can never count out Ohio state. Clemson doesn't matter. Texas, you can count out no matter how good they do recruiting because it's Texas. They're good. They'll screw it up in a way. Just don't know how it's possible, but they will. And so my thing is, I think if you have these big name coaches by getting fired or anything going to a non power five, they can build it up to where they become legitimate contenders. They become a team that it's not all about just, well, they've only won the one game. I think they can make the run. You have fickle who is a power five coach still at UC and he's, buying in and building that program. And I think they're a team that they could make a lot of noise very quickly with the expanded playoff. Fickle is a great example. Uh, he got basically run out of Ohio state. Remember when he had his little stint as the coach and they brought in her. Yeah. And he was terrible. I mean, he, he was, he was overwhelmed, but he's gotten a lot better. Now urban helped him along. I mean, I know urban. He's the rarest guy I've probably ever met in coaching. With that being said, you got to remember where, where UC is. Cincinnati's loaded with talent. And the Buckeyes are recruiting more nationally now. Guess who benefits the most from that? The Bearcats. And good for them. Luke has done a great job. They redshirt the right kids. They bring up kids that other schools don't want and make them good players. Uh, Ahmad Gardner, talk about corners. They only go to certain schools. He's from Detroit. He's an All-American. Michigan didn't offer him. Michigan State didn't offer him. He goes to UC, and he's like third-team All-American or second-team All-American as a freshman. So if you coach him up, like I was talking about with Saban earlier, he gets the elite prospects and coaches him up at DB. 
But if you coach up a kid that's 6'2", 175 pounds, good things can happen. Now, the question is, how long can you sustain it, A, and B, which school is going to come and grab Pickle? Is it going to be Michigan? Is it going to be, you know, I, I don't know who it's going to be. Maybe I have a feeling LSU is going to be looking for a coach pretty soon with all the crap that's going on down in Baton Rouge. Somebody is going to make a run at it. Maybe he's just comfy because that's a great gig. It's a good city to live in. I grew up fairly close to there. But they're probably more exception now. Right now, out of the quote-unquote non-Power 5, they are definitively the best program because they do one thing, the other one's done, play defense. Their defense will swarm to the football. They've got a couple of kids at the end and corner that other schools don't, and that's the difference. Their quarterback's pretty good, but they can line up. I mean, when they played Georgia, now Georgia had a lot of guys out after the draft and all that. They matched up with them very well. I, that shot, I thought Georgia was just going to absolutely run over them, boat racing, and they did. So Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, some of these schools you just kind of think are going to run. That's the one I think it can. And for the school I cover, UCF to get there, you've got to find a way to get a couple of those Ahmad Gardeners and stuff like that. And they can. Florida's loaded with defensive talent. they got to get it. But your point about Hoverson taking the Houston job, that's the second best city in the country for high school football. Miami's the best in terms of producing NFL talent. That's the better job. West Virginia is a terrible job. There's no talent in that state. Hey, hey, hold on. I'm just kidding. No, I agree. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I would rather live there anyway. Where do you think his wife wanted to live? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I, I would have taken the gig too. I want to say that UCF should be thanking Auburn for paying Gus. I'm going to open with that. I mean, what, 20 something million a year? I mean, what do they really need to pay the guy? They should work for free. <laughs> I'll let Gus know you said that, and I'll, I'll give his wife a, a call, too, and see what she says. <laughs> and I agree with your point. Jimmy's and Joe's are better than X's and O's. I agree. As a coach, I mean, it's always easy to have real good players. But my question, what would it mean for a school like UCF to have that home game against that big powerhouse school? Because, you know, the the playoff system, that if they add on to it, you know, they're saying that, they would, if they were the higher seed, they could have the home game in the playoffs. What would that mean for a small school to host a Georgia or an Auburn or, you know, somebody like that? I think that'll happen and happen rather quickly. And here's why. It's Urban made a good point about this a year or two ago. He goes, it's not – he goes, I don't know why, but teams are not given a good deal when they play a tough schedule. You're rewarded for your – wins not your losses so if you win every game and play a very weak schedule you can get in but if you go 11 and one and you lost by a field goal to the number nine team mm-hmm. in the country mm-hmm. and, and he's been right unfortunately that's that's terrible but it's true with that being said if ucf memphis cincinnati or it's going to be one of those four houston gets in i mean george let's say georgia goes 10 and 2 and they're Georgia. I think only school that is more overrated historically in the history of college football than Texas is Georgia. And they find a way with all their five stars to go 10 and two, which they're really good at doing. Why not? Why wouldn't Georgia be the number 11 team? You know, UCF runs the table or Houston runs the table. They're the number 16. That can happen. The thing of it is the odds makers will still favor the SEC school, but it for the hysteria of the school, the environment, the money it brings in, that is the one thing about the expanded playoff that I love. Mm. I mean, not because I cover UCF or whatever. Mm-hmm. If, if you, Let's just say it was Memphis. I would try to find a way to get up there. Yeah. Just as a fan, just to go yeah. tailgate and walk around the parking lot and interview. It would be cool. Now, they would. I would put my money on Georgia, although they let down me and many other people in the world, you know, many a time. <laughs> Herschel Walker is no longer there, uh, much to their chagrin, but it's it's bound to happen because the way unless the playoff committee changes, they reward wins over tough losses. And Georgia's schedule is, is brutal. They got Auburn as their cross game every year. I mean, it's very possible. Why not? So I think there's a good chance you'll see Georgia, Florida, LSU, AM, somebody like that. Auburn, possibly. Ironically, that could be interesting. But Auburn made it. <laughs> And played gut. I mean, come on, that'd be that'd be great. That'd be, cool. that'd be great. 
uh, believe me, Gus Malzahn is on fire right now. He, he's recruiting hard. Every kid mm -hmm. I talk to, mm -hmm. he's into it. He would be, he would be like the space shuttle launch on fire if they had that chance to play. I mean, somebody fired you. You're going to be motivated. It's yeah. just human nature. So, yeah. I mean, and most of his staff has some kind of Auburn tie as well. Let's not kid ourselves. That would be cool. There's going to be some matchups. Like Nick's going to play one of his former assistants again. Little matchups like that are great. I mean, if you look at it from last year, number eight Cincinnati would have hosted number nine Georgia. How many big games have been at Cincinnati? The answer is zero. Okay. There's never been a big game at Cincinnati. And they could have held Georgia in the first round. That would have been huge. That would have been great. And that can happen. And that is where also a lot of fans will – and I guess it's good for us just to watch. They'll complain, well, we're Georgia. We should have been ranked high. All those fun things leading up to the game. And the first time – and if you can only realize this if you've lived down as far south as I have in, in central Florida. The first time a school like Georgia has to go play at a school like Cincinnati mm -hmm. in December or January, <laughs> their fans will not go. They will not go. I mean, it'll be 10 degrees. It'll be hilarious. So that is one of the reasons this is very interesting. If they're truly going to do the home and home, the Southern schools, as much as they like having that extra revenue, are not going to like that idea because Georgia players are not going to play well in the snow and ice. Mm -hmm. That'll be really bad. Yeah, watch the next time Miami plays at Wisconsin. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's going to be hilarious. Those teams just never do. You can't prepare for that unless you've lived in. It's not the same. Will the, this uh, change the scheduling? I, I mean, I sorry, sorry, no, Coach. No, you but, didn't. you know, these bigger schools, they, they play softer schedules. They play these FBS schools. They play, you know, they play the, you know, these high schools in early in the year because they're afraid to lose, I think. So, will there be more bigger games early in the year? Because if they lose them, do they necessarily mean as much? It'll, it'll change nothing because of revenue. The key to winning in college football is money, and money comes from home games. Mm -hmm. If you play teams on the same level, they want a return home game. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you play Louisiana Monroe, their thank you will take that $500,000, that one, whatever it is. <laughs> discussion started, discussion ended. That's it. Nothing will change. It's about money. Those schools cannot survive without Georgia, without A&M, without Arkansas paying them money. Mm -hmm. It's the way it is, especially when they've got – and I'm not trying to pick on it. Title IX money is the real problem. It's very touchy to say that. They can't win in football or anything else because they got to pay for all those women's sports for the equal scholarships in football, throws it completely off tilt. So they've got to go throw their kids to the wolves and play like Florida in the first game. Good luck, guys. Good luck. You know what I mean? So those things aren't going to change because those schools want home and home. Michigan's not going to play Florida. You know, they – they need home games. That's why they play Central Michigan or Western Michigan almost every year. It is what it is. Auburn, My Auburn Miami announced today, in case anybody was wondering, 2029 and 2030. So, well, so by when, then, they might have changed coaches twice each. <laughs> One thing we talked about earlier uh, before we got on was – you know, when you want them to expand it, or if they do expand it, you want them to get it right the first time. You don't want them to expand it to six and us have the same discussion five or six years down the road of, okay, this ain't working, what can we do next? So my question to you is, if they do expand it to 12, what kind of stipulations do they need to have set in stone versus is there an automatic, is there a way we can make it to, we know what we got to do to get in, and then we might have three guys, three or four teams that, that get a surprise. But for you, what if this was expanded to 12, what could they do to make it to where this is the right way and we're not going to change it? We're not going to have any discussions of no more what ifs, no more of this um, uh, towards that aspect of it. This is a subjective subject. So by nature, your question is void. There's always going to be somebody with a different opinion. <laughs> And that opinion will be from the fans that aren't getting what they want, whoever that is. Right. The school, Clemson's winning it, they're going to love it. You know, it's just whoever's winning likes it, whoever's not doesn't. And that's it. So you're never going to satisfy everybody. So that's irrelevant. This will be about one thing, and that's money. 
uh, like I said earlier, when I first came on the show, the athletic director said, this is good for the, it has nothing to do with the kids. It's about filling the coffers for the boosters, for the corporations like Visa, Mercedes, Goodyear, and that's it. Uh, the kids get a more exposure. That's good. But I mean, the Scots go to the campuses anyway to watch them. This is about those institutions and those investors. Uh, the fans think they, oh, this isn't what we wanted. You know, this isn't helping. That's not what this is about. It is a complete smokescreen. They will lie to you for the rest of their life. It is about money. So there's, so like, you know, for example, like with college basketball, if you're the number 69, 70 team that didn't get in, they might bark a little bit, but at the end of the day, right. they could have got their self seen if they had played right. Same thing goes true with the NFL, MLB. You know, we, you can complain or something, but, you know, you could have played your way into it. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you go to 12, in your mind, do you think there needs to be like five automatic, you know, does the power five get an automatic qualifier? Should any of the non-power five have any say? Is there Should there be anything set in stone so that a team like UCF knows, okay, if I do this, I'm in? Should a team like Coastal Carolina or Cincinnati, do you think there could be anything that they could throw out there so that there is some things set in stone so there's not having that what if team sitting on the outside that didn't even, you know, that's the, that, to me, that's the issue. Like UCF, well, I mean, what, what could they have done different that year they went undefeated? They couldn't. You know, you talk about Penn State the year they beat, they won the Big Ten. And I think Wisconsin might have jumped them. Um, and something, my mind went blank on what happened. But it, I think there needs to be some sort of way so we don't we avoid that UCF national championship they have. Just some, something to that degree, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, that is a very complex and long subject, but I'll, <laughs> I'll shorten it. In the, no, it's very complex. You could write your thesis on that. Because nobody wants to play UCF, you're not going to gain anything, but they're pretty good. It's like you said, what can they do? Their schedule, I think it was 2017 or whatever, they claimed the top. They weren't the best team or even close to it. I don't care what UCF claims. They were not. But at the same time, I don't know what else they can do. It's a problem that it's it's nobody's fault because I understand why Florida doesn't play them or AM doesn't play them or Tennessee doesn't play them. I get it. I just don't know how you alleviate it. With that being said, for the playoff system, because of what I, you know, you said, and I just re reverberated, it's hard to gauge how you put them in. Look, if you, just based on talent, UCF's not a top twenty team. It's not. UCF fans can throw mud at me all day. I, I, I know what it's like to be at a practice with some of these schools where ten guys walk by me that are three hundred pounds that are lean. That's not happening at most Power Five schools, but some, and it's not happening at any school that's non Power Five in numbers. And again, that's the war daddy thing. They don't get those kids. There's no way in the world you're going to see a quote unquote guarantee for those schools, in my opinion. But the power five schools won't care if they give one or two because they expect to stomp them anyway. So maybe they'll give them one or two. It's not going to matter. They're going to be somewhere between nine, 10, 11, and 12. And they'll have to, you know, win a road game. If they do, then, you know, then you get to play Alabama who's rested. Good luck. <laughs> so, I, I don't know how they're going to do that. And again, you got to remember, these are proposals that are right. being thrown out. Right. They don't mean anything, not squat. How many are they going to get? Is there going to be a cap on a number in the conference? I mean, you could put five teams from the SEC in every year. You could. It's just true. And I, I know everybody hates the SEC, and I'm not a big fan either. I can't stand their fan bases. But they have by far the most talent. It's not even competitive. So the third team in the SEC could win most other leagues. It's just the way it is. And you're going to have a hard time convincing if the first year it happens, let's say UCF and Memphis get in just to use them. If they get obliterated, it is really bad for non-Power 5. Because then the, well, why didn't you take North Carolina from the ACC as your second school behind Clemson? Why That's didn't you take, you know what I mean? You, you better point. do something with it or else they're going to have legitimate reach. You lost 41-9 to nine to Texas A&M. Why are we bringing you back? There's no rebuttal for that. That first round where whoever makes it, if you lose, it's one thing. Do not get blown out. It's a very and good one. It's, 
you know, if you get blown out by Alabama, that's one thing. I mean, they, they crushed Ohio State and Notre Dame in the playoff last year. Between those two, they put like 17 guys in the NFL draft. You know what I mean? So they were really good. Alabama was just better. But if you get beat by a second or third place team from one of the power fives in your opening playoff game, I'm very concerned about that for the non-power five, UCF or otherwise, because then it's going to be hard for those guys to sign off on them the next year, the year after that, because there's evidence against it. So, but of course, on the other side, if they do well, it opens, opens the door for a lot of Yes. The only thing you can do there is just wait for it to happen. But that, that is a concern. Definitely. Well, that goes back to what you're talking about when it could affect the next year. When you go back to Michigan State a couple of years ago, and you remember that whole reaction, it wasn't Michigan State was the team out of the Big Ten. I think it was Ohio State. But they still, it was, for being a Big Ten champion, it was still so hard to convince a ton of people to let them in because of what had happened to Michigan State the year before. They just got completely smoked, completely smoked. And so what you're making that point of, which I agree is it could just, it, you have one team, just, it's just bad. It could set back non-power fives for years and years and years and years. And it just limits the whole thing where a lot of people, the whole idea they think of expanding this is to help the non-power five. The non-power five could kill themselves in one full sweep, one full sweep in one try by just getting completely slaughtered by some, whoever. And it doesn't matter who it, it could be. Alabama would be, like you said, you kind of get a, a mulligan on that one. But if you lose to the third place, the fourth place team, it's not going to be good. And then it just limits you for years to come. And you just don't know how it turns out. Yeah, I don't I don't think you can really put a cap on how important that statement you just made is. If they get beat 41 to nine by AM and they come in third in the SEC, you will never hear the end of it. And it's pretty hard to – to say much um, to your point about Michigan state. I know that team pretty well. I've covered it in some capacity. I used to cover Notre Dame a lot. I knew they didn't match up with Alabama and their offense was built to run inside. Well, where is Alabama strongest? I was like, this is, they're going to be lucky to score 10 points. They scored three or nothing. I mean, they didn't, they, they barely crossed midfield most of the game and they had some NFL guys. You have to be able to hit big plays against schools like that. Again, Jimmy's and Joe's. I need to get the ball on a five-yard hitch to a guy that you are scared to death that he's going to make my safety and my corner and my outside linebacker all look bad. Had nothing to do with me, but I'm coaching him. You know what I mean? And that's – they don't have guys like that very often at schools like Michigan State, Iowa State. They just don't, let alone non-power five. Well, and then you look at what that happened to Michigan State and where have they been since then. It, it, and you no, could make it, a it case that it just kills them. And oh, yeah. can you imagine what it could do to – Look at Cincinnati with Fickle. We talk about Fickle and we sing his praises and they get matched up against just the wrong team. And look what could happen to UC, which now I think you could make a different case because of the pride that they have there. But Michigan State, you can't go against the pride Michigan State had. That's a great program. They were they were a really good building program at that time. And things just all kind of hit at the same time with the uh, scandal and all that. But it could go really a long way in a bad direction for a non-power five if they do match up against the wrong team. And and like that, we, we would love to say, oh, you'll get another chance if it's Alabama. But people are tired of Alabama winning, except for Alabama fans. And they want them to lose to someone. And they would like love it no better than a smaller school like Coastal Carolina to do it. But Zero if chance. Coastal Carolina doesn't do it, <laughs> it's never going to happen. And so then yeah. it just it kills them, and then you can't. Then people are like, "Well, they had their chance; they played them, and then it's dead." And then you die on that. And then the non-power five is a joke. And you know, you have your guys like Dana Holgerson down at Houston, who people think was the best hire ever, and he's a moron, and he's going to be out in a couple months anyways of a job. So it just loses your credibility as a non-power five. So it continues to plummet. It's the same thing over and over, man. Give me Gabe Dindy. You can have whoever you want as your coach. It's just a revolving door, constantly revolving. Yeah, that's what I – if you go to a practice for Alabama, uh, if you – just middle of the level here. If you go to a Baylor practice, they run the 3-4 scheme, which is bigger D lineman. It's the same scheme they brought from LSU. Dave Aranda, great coach. And then you go to a non-power five. Just watch the offensive and defensive linemen. But then you come back with a straight face and tell me 
where those schools are going to do well against Alabama or Clemson. Football is the most unique sport on the planet. It is not like college basketball. People get this, oh, I like basketball. Well, if so-and-so won and, you know, a one versus six. One versus 16 doesn't happen in college football. It's a different it, – it's, it's like a high school team playing an eighth-grade team in some ways if they're healthy. Again, that's – you know, you got to have your quarterback and all that stuff in play. Barring that not being in the case, you're looking at a very odd situation because Coastal Carolina, UCF, et cetera, they've got to get more guys. UCF, I think, will be in the playoff out of the non-power five more than anybody – because, like I said earlier, Gus is motivated, and Travis Williams is a phenomenal recruiter. He's going to start getting some guys that other schools won't because he's got unbelievable personality. Um, but that's the exception, not the rule. One school doesn't mean Power Five is going to get over the hump either, as a whole, not Power Five. So, again, find me those schools that are going to get you four- and five-star corners, four- and five-star D-linemen, and I will show you your top six in the rankings. If you look at the rivals or ESPN or 247 recruiting rankings, you can plug them right into your college football playoff. It's the one sport it is just straight on. So yeah, prove me wrong. Well, I think I, I know I'm, I've gotten more than enough than I need. I think you guys have anything else to add to this one, coach or Phil? Just, just a final remark. I remember in 2007 mm -hmm. when App State beat Michigan. I remember that game. I remember exactly where I was. I remember exactly what I was doing. I remember who was I did too. watching it was the game. Great. As a sports fan in general, you, you don't forget those memories because that's why we love sports. We love sports for the, for the unrightable moments or the things that shouldn't happen. And so, you know, if Bama's going to beat people by 40. But if for some reason we let these underdogs come in, I mean, I'm Coastal Carolina, if you play Bama 100 times – Bama would probably win over 90 of those times. No questions asked. Maybe maybe, maybe 99. But if for some reason we could see that one on TV, that's yeah. I mean, you're going to remember that day forever. And so for me personally, I'm excited for the expansion just because it's going to give that chance. I mean, it's like you said, basketball and football is way different. You know, I, I, I completely agree. But those upsets are going to happen from time to time just because that's, that's how sports works. And so I personally, I'm excited about what could happen from it, what could come from it. And I'm, I'm ready for that first upset of the playoffs. Me too. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brian. We will definitely, we really want you to come back when college football starts. We'll get a, we would love the whole breakdown on UCF. I know Phil would as a former, as an Auburn fan with his uh, <laughs> oh, final, you know, his head coach <laughs> gone down there. So we would well, love for you to come back. For sure. Uh, just a little warning to him. They'll be hiring another coach in about three years. So. <laughs> you're right. You're right. I agree. I think you're right. I think you're right. Thanks hiring for joining us, Brian. Freaking, oh, no problem. Hiring a guy from Idaho to go to Southern Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was more Terrible fun. idea. Terrible idea. Not going to pay. Anyway, you guys have a great night. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Brian. You. Thank you. That was that.